Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes What's the Lord, oh my soul? His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger Your name is great your heart is kind for all your goodness I will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to find bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name and on that day when my strength is failing and draws me time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then forevermore forevermore bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship him his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name bless the Lord oh my soul oh my soul worship his holy name Sing like never before, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name, I'll worship your holy name. Morning, everyone. Welcome. Hey, Ruth. Hey, Braden. Brandon. Braden had it right the first time. That's going to happen a few times, you guys. Just uh, I'm trying to come up with a combination that's going to work for both. I'm not kidding. Uh, please join us afterwards after the service for coffee and snacks. Good time of fellowship we've got some sandwiches uh, left over from yesterday so yesterday our church hosted a celebration of life for Pam Blacklock and I just want to thank everyone who helped out uh, bringing food setting up sound PowerPoint streaming cleaning up and uh, and bringing the message obviously 
Um, it was a great way to help out a family that was grieving and a good way, a good opportunity to share the gospel in both words and action. So I just thank you very much. Uh, family camp. So as promised, I've got the information here. It's, uh, it's on the back table. It's similar structure to last year. Uh, and we've kept the prices similar. And have a look at it. Okay, I'm getting a lot of blank looks because we've got a lot of new people here. I haven't done this. So um, you'll see on the registration, there's the different types of accommodation. We've got log cabins, A-frame, dorm, um, lodge room, and then RV sites and tent sites. So lots of different things. One thing I do want to point out, the prices on here are for two nights. So everyone here, it's for two nights. It's not for each night. That comes up every year. Um, so just have a look at that. Also, the food is in here. So under six is free. We thought about changing that, considering the pastor's got so many kids, but we <laughs> left it there. Seven to 11 is $20, and 12 and up is going to be $40. That's for the whole weekend. Um, it's quite a bit of food. So have a look. If you've got any questions, just come and see me. It's not that complicated. The itinerary, it starts Friday night. It's out at Rock Nest. It starts Friday night. Um, so you can get set up, and then it's really just a lot of junk food that night and playing games. Saturday, we start with a breakfast, get into a chapel. There's a couple chapels that day. We've got different activities planned, and uh, obviously lots of food. And then Sunday will be breakfast, and then clean up, and then we get into the Sunday school picnic which would be a lunch out at the camp, okay? So I'll be talking about this over the next few weeks, but please register. Um, we like to get a lot of people out there and just know who's going to be there. We decided this year, first family to register and actually pay and get everything set up. Um, you get to put your name down first on the list for activities, so um, that's actually a pretty big deal. If, uh, if you want to do the, the big zip line to get your name on there first, that means no two-hour lineup. So be the first, and that's, uh, that could be you. Okay. Um, what else we got? Oh, if you're interested in child dedications or baptism, please see Pastor Jared. Uh, please talk to him. We're thinking of uh, child dedications out at family camp. And uh, there's youth this Friday at the church from 6 till 8. The ladies' brunch is coming up next Saturday on the 27th. That's 10 till noon. If that's news to you, um, you haven't been listening. <laughs> but uh, if it is news, I don't think it's too late, right? Is it too late? It's not too late. Um, so see uh, Denise, Sherry, or Cindy. And men's breakfast, we're not going to be uh, meeting next Saturday because the ladies have said they don't want a bacon smell in the basement. So they're going to be in the basement, so we will not be. But we're going to resume again on, uh, on uh, June 3rd. We've just got two left to go. And uh, if you haven't been, that's fine. Come on out. Uh, not next Saturday, the one after. Because um, we had 15 guys yesterday, which is great for a long weekend. Okay. Did I miss anything? Any other announcements? No? Okay. The scripture reading today is Psalm 95, 1 to 7. Psalm 95, 1 to 7. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Let's pray. Father, you are the king above all kings, the God above all gods. You are the rock of our salvation. You are the great creator. You created everything from the heavens and the earth. Everything that we see, you created with your hands and you keep in your hands. Lord, you 
created us, each and every one of us, and we are the flock under your care. You have given us your word, you have given us your love and your son, and we thank you for that, Lord. Lord, help us today to focus on your word. Help us to take the distractions of our busy lives, of a distractful world, um, away from our minds, Lord. Clear our hearts and our minds so that we can focus on your word today. And Lord, help us to stay on that path that you have given each of us. Lord, we thank you for Pastor Jared. We thank you for his strong teaching. We thank you for his love for this congregation. We ask that you would give him the words that you want us to hear today. And Lord, we ask that you would uh, bless the offering that is collected today and the offering that is collected during this week, that it would be a blessing to your earthly ministry here. And we thank you for this, and we ask it in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. to say, Lord, is you who gave me life and I can explain just how much you mean to me now that you have saved me, Lord. I give all that I am to you that every day I can be a light that shines your name. Every day, Lord, I'll Learn to stand upon your word, and I pray that I, that I might come to know you more than you would guide me in every single step I take that every day I can be a light unto the world every day. It's you I live for every day. I follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. Every day, Lord, I'll learn to stand upon your word, and I pray that I, that I might come to know you more than you would guide me in every single step I take. Up. Every day I can a light unto the world every day. It's you I live for every day. I'll follow after you every day. I'll walk with you, my Lord. It's you I live for every day. It's you I live for Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, oh, it's you I live for. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, I'll follow after you. Every day, I'll walk with you, my Lord. Every day, it's you I live for. Every day, I'll follow.
has captured me. Your grace has set me free. Your life, the air I breathe, be glorified in me. Your love. Your love has captured me. Your grace has set me free. Your life, the air I breathe, be glorified in me. You set my feet to dance in. You set my heart on fire. The presence of a thousand kings. You are my one desire. I stand before you now with trembling hands lifted high. Be glorified. Your love has captured me. Your grace has set me free. Your life, the air I breathe, be glorified in me. You set my feet to dancing. You set my heart on fire in the presence of a thousand kings. You are my one desire. And I stand before you now with trembling hands lifted high. Be glorified in me. Be glorified in me. Be glorified in me. Be glorified. And me be glorified in me, be glorified in me, be glorified in me, be glorified. You set my feet a dancing, you set my heart on fire in the presence of a thousand kings, you are my one desire, and I stand before you now with trembling hands lifted high. Be glorified. bit of a cold this week. Actually, a lot of a cold this week. <laughs> and my voice is like just about to completely give out. So it's good to hear lots of voices, but you might have to fill in even more. Especially on the south. So let's see how loud we can sing together. In stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whisper of love in the dead of the night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I never You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, I've seen many searching for. I know we're all searching. 
You died and rose again. I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted. You were condemned. I'm alive and well. Your spirit lives within me because you died and rose again. Amazing love. My King would die for me. Amazing love, I know it's true. It's my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. You are my. Jesus, you are my King. Jesus, you are my King. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my King, would die? my joy to honor you in all I do. I honor you. Kids Church, come on up, kiddos. How are all of you this morning? Good. Did you get lots of sun this week? Mm-hmm. Who got a sunburn? Me. <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to go down into the cool basement, and we're going to learn some more about Jesus this morning. Okay? So why don't we pray before we go down? Do I have a volunteer this morning to pray? Any of you kiddos? Would you like to, Emery? God, help us to have a good day. Thank you for this great sunshine today. Thank you for uh, all this stuff you gave us. Amen. Amen.
Good morning. Uh, I'm excited about the passage that we're going to look at today, and I feel silly even saying that because it should always be exciting to take a look at God's Word. But this morning in particular, I'm excited about this specific text, and I hope that you will be too. So please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 26 through 31. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. And I ask that if you're able, you would stand with me as we reverence the public reading of God's word. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and this opportunity to be here together. Thank you for your living and active word. This morning, I pray, God, that you would remove from us distractions, that you would settle the hurts and the pains and the grievances, all these things that are going on that each one of us is dealing with in a different way to a different extent. And Lord, you know our sorrows, you know our distractions, you know the things that are taking so much space in our minds right now, and I pray that you would deliver your word to us, your people, this morning. Yeah, that if there's anything in me that would be in the way, that you would remove it. Yeah, that I would not be a hindrance to your word going to your people. Preach to us, I pray. And Lord, for those real things happening in our lives, whether it's medical information, new diagnoses, unknowns, or the many other things that weigh us down, that cause us pain. There's so much going on for parents and for young people, for children, for teachers in the schools, and for all of us here. Sometimes it's a very difficult world. But Lord, let us rejoice that you are our strength. Be with us in this place that we would know your presence and your power. Amen. Before you are seated, I wasn't planning on doing this, but uh, maybe you guys can indulge me a little bit today. I could really use a leap for joy. (laughs) That might have been a surprise. But uh, on the count of three, you're going to jump up in the air, put one or two hands up in the air, and just say, praise God. Because our God is good no matter what's going on in our lives. Okay, one, two, three. Thank you. You guys can be seated. In our world today, there seems to be a constant dialogue in all spheres of life and influence regarding wisdom, intelligence, experience, and the authority by which someone is able to speak. The wisdom of this world says things like, Darwinian evolution is a fact, creation is foolish make-believe, the Bible is a fairy tale for simple-minded people. You can't speak about women's issues if you aren't a woman. You can't speak about teenagers if you don't have teenagers. You can't speak about LGBTQT if you aren't LGBTQTIA2S+. You can't speak about the education system if you aren't a teacher or a principal. Now, whether or not you realize it, these kinds of statements are pieces of the wisdom of this world. And interestingly enough, these arguments are logical fallacies. 
ad hominem attacks where you attack the person's intelligence, morals, education, or whatever else. Or the invincible ignorance fallacy where you refuse to listen to an argument because you've already decided that it's wrong, that you're right. There's other logical fallacies that can apply here as well. Yet how often do we fall into these things? Even as Christians who say that we believe in absolute truth, can be confusing, right? Our culture is obsessed with psychology, education, debates, and within and beyond all of that, arguments regarding your ability to speak on certain issues. There's lots of talk about intelligence and wisdom. You know, there was a time when the gospel was going out into the world, into towns and cities that were filled with Jews and Greeks. Jews who cared particularly about signs and wonders. You could say experiences. And Greeks who cared about philosophy, pontificating and debating. Things we see strongly captivating minds and lives in the world around us today. And it's in this milieu of human wisdom where the message of the gospel of Christ seems like foolishness. To some, it's literally laughable. To others, it's detestable. To many, it's unpalatable. Aleister Crowley said, one would go mad if one took the Bible seriously, but to take it seriously, one must be already mad. In his book, The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins said The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. God help Richard Dawkins. Because he's going to give an account for those words. In an essay, Bertrand Russell wrote, there is one very serious defect to my mind in Christ's moral character. And that is that he believed in hell. I do not myself see that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. Christ certainly, as depicted in the Gospels, did believe in everlasting punishment. And one does find repeatedly a vindictive fury against those people who would not listen to his preaching. An attitude which is not uncommon with preachers but which does somewhat detract from superlative excellence. You do not, for instance, find that attitude in Socrates. You find him quite bland and urbane toward the people who would not listen to him. And it is, to my mind, far more worthy of a sage to take that line than to take the line of indignation. This is some of the wisdom of this world. Let's take a look at our text, but back it up and read verses 18 to 25. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ 
the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Isn't that incredible? I mean, there's just so much in those verses. I could talk about these verses for hours. Don't worry, that wasn't a threat. But it shouldn't surprise us when the world thinks that the Bible and the gospel are foolish or that we're crazy for our beliefs. We've been told to expect it. Right from the time of Jesus and the apostles, the world has hated the message of the cross. But for us, the message of Christ's work on the cross and his resurrection are the power of God. And there's something amazing that we can trust. The words that Paul references here from Isaiah, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Essentially, the wisdom of this world means nothing, especially compared to the wisdom of God. Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? They're irrelevant. They're made to be nothing. The wisdom of God puts them and their wisdom to shame. In all the so-called wisdom of the world, salvation was not found. God chose to work outside of, often opposite to, the wisdom of the world to bring about our salvation. The Jews demanded signs and the Greeks demanded wisdom as they perceived and understood it. But you know how Paul responds to these demands? By preaching Christ crucified. Verses 23 to 25, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Pragmatically, that doesn't make sense, right? Or practically. I mean, the Jews and the Greeks, they wanted something. Arguably something that Paul could deliver to them. Something at times he does deliver. But he says that instead he preached Christ. Something that he knows is a stumbling block and considered foolishness. This just seems to contradict so much of how we try to operate today, doesn't it? We want to appeal to what others want, so maybe they'll listen or consider. We try to cater to the passions and the desires of unbelievers, hoping that somehow they'll believe. But Paul preached Christ crucified. Why would he do that? How could he do that? Couldn't he just appeal to them in much easier ways or with more palatable tactics? Well, look how fast our human reasoning and worldly wisdom rears its head and alters our thinking. But it really seems like Paul is choosing the harder way. But Paul knew something that we need to remember. Remember. For us as believers, there's no greater power, no greater wisdom, no greater strength than the gospel. Do you believe that today? I'm not just asking if you believe that the gospel is good or cool or important. Do you believe that Christ crucified and risen is power and majesty and wisdom far beyond the reasoning of this world? Can the message of the cross supersede our types and forms and venues and presentations? 
And more personally, is the salvation of Christ the thing that excites and influences you most in your daily life? I want you to ponder that question when we take a look at the verses of our text. Verse 26, for consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that there's some encouragement and life in these words if you can get past being offended, maybe. Most people are average, right? That's why it's called average. Of course, in our experience, we think most people we interact with must be below average. Maybe you find yourself feeling that way as well. But it doesn't matter. You don't have to be the world's best athlete, computer programmer, mathematician, husband, mother, philosopher, or anything else in order to earn God's favor. You don't have to be on one of Forbes' top earners list or win the most influential person of the year award in order to be saved. God shows you as you are. He loved you regardless of how average you may be. He loves you and values you no matter how much this world with all of its systems, classes, and labels may devalue you or make you feel unloved and unappreciated. He's not looking for who this world says is valuable or who this culture praises. He pours out his love, mercy, and grace upon you. And it's because of his work on your behalf that your value far exceeds any title or accolade that this world could bestow. Years ago, I was talking with a lovely, tender-hearted woman. And she said, I know I'm not very smart, but I know I love Jesus, and I know he died for me. You know what? Greater wisdom came from her lips that day than from the lecture halls, debates, or podcasts of this world's so-called elite thinkers. brings us to the next two verses, 27 and 28. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. It's okay not to be the best, fastest, wisest, prettiest, strongest, or whatever else. God created us. He designed us. He knit us together in our mother's wombs. He made each one of us unique with different gifts, abilities, talents, weaknesses, and obstacles to navigate and overcome. We are his craftsmanship, his masterpiece. We don't have to be ashamed that we aren't something we're not. And we shouldn't compare ourselves to others and to their skills and abilities that we don't have. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Fearfully and wonderfully made. No matter how simple, foolish, or weak you may feel, or this world may tell you that you are. And it's within the context of that truth that we can see the incredible thing that God has done. He didn't come just to die for kings and rulers, the powerful and the rich, the wise and sophisticated. He came as a prince to die for the pauper. He came as the king to lay his life down for a servant. He came for the weak, the simple, the poor, the lost, the broken, the hurting, the downcast and downtrodden. He came for the marginalized and the overlooked. He chose to love and value those who this world says are worthless or 
less valuable. He chose to give up his life for those that this world would consider foolish. And all of this shames the worldly wise. Those who would puff up their chests and boldly proclaim that through their great intellect, they're assured there is no God. They are the ones who will truly be put to shame. Those who trust in their own strength and abilities to save them, one day they'll realize how utterly useless all their strength is. Those who are rich and celebrated and adored by the world today will one day realize that all their followers and fans, all their mansions and boats, all they valued is worthless. And they forfeited or rejected the only thing that was truly a treasure worth valuing. Jesus. It's heartbreaking to think that there are many today who hate the cross of Christ. They hate the message of Jesus. It's foolishness, weakness, it's folly. But one day they'll stand before the judge and realize just how empty their wisdom really is. We must labor over these souls in our conduct, our speech, and our prayers so that they may be saved. so that their eyes would be opened, that they would see their great need for salvation, that they would behold true wisdom, so that their lives would be changed and their souls saved. We must remember the words of verse 29, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. We aren't saved because we were the strongest or brightest. We weren't saved because our great wisdom or intellect. God even says that to his people, Israel. And he says, I didn't choose you because you were the greatest number or that there was anything special about you for me to have. We love God because he first loved us. We experience the saving work of Christ because the Holy Spirit drew us and gave us enough wisdom to see our need for a Savior and then drew us to the place of surrender and adoration. We're saved because in our hopeless and helpless position, God looked down and said, there's a people that I love, a people that are for my own possession. I want them. And so he made a plan. He made a way where there was no way. We owed a price we couldn't pay, so he paid a debt he never owed. He sent his only begotten son, his beloved son, to come to this earth to take on the weakest form imaginable, to live a life all so that he could stand in your place and mine, so that he could be our substitution, so that he could take the beatings, take the whipping, the scourging that was meant for us, that he could hang there with nail-pierced hands and feet, he could cry out with a loud voice to the Father in our place. He died for you and me. It's incredible. We didn't deserve it. Such love, such love, such marvelous love that God should love a sinner such as I. How marvelous is love like this. Are you seeing that this morning? Our suffering Savior. Do you see the glory that is His? Are you in awe of His love for you and His pursuit after you? Look at verse 30. And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. There's a positional truth here. It's an identity statement. You are in Christ. This kind of language isn't unique to this statement. 
Paul speaks this way elsewhere. You have been buried with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 8.1 says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 13.14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. There's a glorious truth that Christ is in us as believers. And there's this beautiful reality that we are in Christ. It's something that should impact our lives each and every day. I'm no longer who I was. Christ is in me and I am in Him. I'm a new creation. Yes, imperfectly. Perhaps you've heard it say, I'm not who I ought to be, but praise God I'm not who I was. There's an intimacy here that we can't take flippantly or as if we're just reading information in a textbook. This is huge. It's life-altering. God loves us, saves us, and transforms us. Paul goes on to say something about this Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Here we go again with the gospel, the power of God for salvation to those who believe, to everyone who believes. You want to know and experience wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, redemption? Look to Christ. You want to know them more fully? Continue to seek after Christ. He is the embodiment of these things. He's the source. He's the fountain flowing with living water where we can go and we can drink. We can keep coming and drinking living water so that we can be marked by wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that we can live in a way that glorifies God and tells this world that we are new creatures, new creations. The old is gone and the new has come. Praise God. Look at our last verse, 31. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The one who boasts in their own abilities and wisdom and never knows the salvation of Christ will only find judgment and damnation. But for us who are saved, This is a strong reminder that we weren't saved because of ourselves. We weren't saved because of anything we did or anything that we are. We are saved because we have a Savior. So we better guard against judging unbelievers. We better guard against pride rising up in us and deceiving us to think that we somehow contributed something to our salvation. It's a gift. The most precious and wonderful gift that anyone ever has or ever will receive. So this passage is a great reminder of the words of Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. However, there's something else here. We can boast. In fact, we should boast loudly and triumphantly. We should declare the wonder and the glory of our salvation from the street corners and the rooftops. But instead of boasting in ourselves, we celebrate and declare our Lord. 
We boast of his incredible love. We boast of his great sacrifice. We boast of his wisdom that is so far beyond what the world considers wise. We boast of his good and perfect plans and promises. We boast of his miraculous work in our lives. We boast that he could take sinful, hopeless messes like you and I and make us new creations. We boast of Christ crucified and we boast of his resurrection for we are not ashamed of the gospel. We rejoice in it. We celebrate it. We boast in it. Dear people, there's much talk these days of wisdom and power. But don't let yourself get caught up in the systems and patterns of this world. Don't be deceived by fancy words, crafty reasoning, or even arguments that line up with your experiences. We must take every thought captive and bring it into subjection to Christ and his living word. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says, We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. If you don't have those two verses memorized, I would suggest hiding them in your heart. Those around us and influencing us will try to convince us of worldly principles of wisdom and power, but our God is greater than the systems of men. His wisdom is far beyond our nation's greatest thinkers. So we can have hope and confidence in the message of salvation that we get to bring into this world. We can trust that God will use our boasting in Him and His gospel to lead people to wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Houston Baptist Church, be encouraged today. And be confident in the wisdom and the power of our God. There is none greater. Be strengthened and renewed today as you think upon the glorious gospel of Christ. Be filled with boldness as you go out to share the message of Jesus with the world. Be encouraged as you behold the goodness, might, and majesty of our God. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. As it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Father, this morning, fill us with awe for all you are and all you've done. God, you are incredible. Our minds truly cannot fathom. We can't search the depths of all that you are and understand your greatness. It is unsearchable. And yet, Lord, you've revealed yourself to us. You've given us your word so that we can know you. You've brought us salvation. You've adopted us who have believed as sons and daughters. You've sent your spirit to dwell inside of us, to give us wisdom and understanding and strength and power. God, 
your love is incredible. Thank you, Lord, for your great faithfulness to us. For any here who, today who don't know you, who don't know your wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, God, open their eyes. Draw them to you that they would know, that they would taste and see that you are good and that they would be ones who would declare, who would boast loudly in your goodness, in the gospel message. Lord, encourage our hearts, strengthen us, fill us with resolve and boldness, and increase our love for you this day, I pray. In Jesus' name, by your strength and power. Amen. I ask the music team to uh, come up here. And as they're getting ready, I don't know where you're at in life. I don't know what's going on, the struggles, the inner wrestlings. I don't know how God is working in your heart today. Conviction or just overwhelmed by his love and grace. But if there's something that you need to deal with with him, I encourage you, I challenge you to come up to the front. Get on your knees. Seek him. No, there's no magic or power in this location. But there is something to forgetting about the people around you, to laying it all on the line, to getting up, to physically show the brokenness of a contrite heart, and just to seek God. So as they play, just join me up here and pray. Strange and lovely sound I hear it in the thunder and the rain It's ringing in the sky Like cannons in the night The music of the universe plays I'm singing you are holy Great and mighty The moon and the stars Declare who you are so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. I sing of how great you are. Beautiful and free, the song of galaxies. Rich and far beyond the Milky Way Let's join in with the sound Come on, let's sing it loud As the music of the universe plays We're singing to you, our holy Great and mighty The moon and the stars Declare who you are I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. I sing of how great you are. All glory, honor, power is yours, amen. All glory, honor, power is yours, amen. All glory, honor, power is yours forever, amen. Sing all glory, all glory, honor, power is yours, amen. All glory, honor, power is yours, amen. All glory, honor, power is yours forever, Singing, you are holy, great and mighty, the moon and the stars, declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still.
still you love me forever my heart sing of how great you are sing all glory all glory honor power is yours amen all glory honor power is yours amen all glory honor power is yours forever amen all glory honor power is yours amen all glory honor power is yours amen all glory honor power is yours forever amen we're singing to you The moon and the stars declare who you are. I'm so unworthy, but still you love me forever, my heart. I'll sing a hell May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Go in peace and join us downstairs for fellowship.